Hello, I am Josh Gentry, a real director for Snack Reads, and I have the great privilege today to be here talking with uh, author Susie Charnes. And we've been intending to do this for a while, something like this, but uh, this month being uh, Women in Genre Month has been a good catalyst to actually get together and do it. Okay. So I don't have any like bio of you to read or anything, so yeah. we can just jump right into it. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I read in an interview uh, you did previously, um, you said you started writing when you were quite young, six, eight, yes, somewhere in that very, age. Yes, very, very young. I was a kid. I, I taught myself to read because my mom worked and my dad had left. So um, one of the things I did to fill time <laughs> was to learn how to read. And because my mother couldn't stand not having me doing something, so that was that. And um, I had been read to as a kid a lot by my parents. And that is really something I found to be pretty much constant in all the writers I know. They were read to as children, and so you get that connection to the written word. And so I started drawing things in, um, in my dad's dummy books. He was an illustrator. <clears throat> and I would write my own stories in there. And so you had a bunch of blank books. Yeah, there. there were a bunch of little blank pamphlets lying around that were for sketches. And that's what I started with. Cowboy stories. Cowboy stories. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cowboy stories with horses. With horses. Them, yeah. okay. Cool. And it it seems like you knew pretty early on too that that, that was going to be your vocation. Um, I, I think I knew I couldn't find the stories I wanted at the library. So I was going to write them for myself. And I realized that I really enjoyed doing it. And I started getting ambitious. And I started reading um, real books you know, and stuff pretty early, like nine, ten, well, from the library, mm -hmm. uh, not from school, <coughs> fairly early. And um, I knew I liked really doing it, and my teachers encouraged me very much. I had wonderful teachers as a kid. And so I, I knew when I went to high school that it was going to be either art or it was going to be writing. And we didn't know which. I went to a school called Music and Art in New York as an art student because my, both of my parents were painters. And uh, while I was there, I had a, um, a spectacular English teacher. In fact, she has a, a scholarship fund named after her at that school, which is now has a different name, uh, Regina Barnes. And she really encouraged me. And it, um, it just took off. And it turned out that faced with a place to draw pictures or paint and a typewriter in those days, it was the typewriter that I ended up in. That's interesting because you know, one's visual and one's written, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are very heavily one way or the other. But you had an inclination both ways, it sounds. Well, I think I was encouraged in the visual direction by my parents, really. I, I don't think that was my natural inclination, because I don't think in pictures. And that's one reason I can't write screenplays. I just, I don't see the action. I hear what, I, what I'm writing. So um, it's just, it, not, it really wasn't natural to me, but it gave me a a really terrific background in the arts, which I love, in, in visual art museums, comic books, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But yeah, it was um, it was kind of encouraged in my house to, to draw and paint and, you know, don't bother me, go paint something. <laughs> and, and it worked out pretty well for all three, for my sisters too. One of my sisters is, is a painter, and the other one was a sculptor for a while. And you, um, it sounds like you planned your college curriculum around preparing you to be a writer, or preparing for a writing career? Yeah, I, um, I had been, re I, I read a lot of books as a kid. I used to come home from the library with stacks up to here, I couldn't see over them. And, <clears throat> and I'd be reading five or six at a time. And so I finished with the children's section really fast, and I, then I went through the biography section. And the next thing you know, I was reading adult novels because the librarians didn't know what to do with me. So I was reading things like, um, there was a lot of post-colonial fiction coming out at the time. Stories of adventure and war set in ex-colonies in Africa, say. Or <clears throat> in the islands in the Caribbean. Island in the Sun was one. There was one about the Mau Mau called, I don't remember, what, something of value, I think. And there were a number of other really well-known and um, very popular books about what happened in these countries after, in, in the post-war withdrawal of European uh, administrators from these places. And I thought I was going to write adventure stories set in those places. So I thought, well, 
I really don't want to have to go research and make sure it's accurate to such and such a country when I use a setting. I want to be able to construct my own, a, a convincing country for my adventure to take place in. And so I kind of figured out that the way you do that is you figure out what makes a country work. How does it work? And that led me to um, cobble up a major in college, which at that time did not exist, as far as I know. This was in the fifth, early 50s. Um, economic history. And nobody really taught that. They taught economics and they taught history. And I had to put it together because I knew I needed to know how it looked and what its history was, but I needed to know how it worked, how the economy of an imaginary country could work. Also, I'd been reading a lot of science fiction, and a lot of science fiction at that time had a very strong anthropological slant. So, you know, the people would get off the spaceship and there would be a tribe of aliens that they'd have to deal with, or a, a group of tribes. <clears throat> and there'd be a political and economic system that they would have to cope with and, and find a way into. And that kind of shaped my thinking in that direction. So I said economic history, because I want to write stories set in um, something like post-colonial Kenya, or something like post-colonial Cameroon. And that was kind of what steered me in that direction. I also wanted to write a Western. <laughs> it all goes back to the horses. It, it sure does go back to the <laughs> darn horses. And I was a city kid. There were no horses, except at one stable on 89th Street, <laughs> where I occasionally got to ride. But yeah, it, it was the horses I definitely wanted to. The cowboys and the horses. <laughs> I was a Tom Mix fan. Everybody else was Gene Autry or Roy Rogers. I picked the, you know, the, the underdog. <laughs> also <laughs> typical. <laughs> From the beginning. From the beginning. And so why science fiction? Did it come from reading a lot of science fiction? Yeah, or? see, we didn't have a lot of money because we were one of the first divorces, you know, early divorce situation with children in New York. Um, I was born in 39, so my dad left about when I was about eight. And um, actually, my mother kicked him out, but that's okay. And uh, so I couldn't buy books. We didn't have a lot of spare cash. My mom worked at, in, in the textile business uh, as an artist, doing textile designs for, like, design on the shirt here. Not dresses, but designs. And um, so I had to get all my books from the library, reading from the library. But I did have a corner store. We all had corner stores in New York City in those days where there were magazine racks and there was a, a malt counter. <coughs> and I would go and I'd get a malted and that would be my excuse to go browse the magazine racks. And there were all these wonderful pulp magazines full of science fiction stories. And so eventually I got tired of the horses and Bob summoned battle, the dog ones, and uh, <laughs> what else was I reading? And the westerns. And um, I started picking up these pulp magazines. At that time, I guess it was amazing and fantasy and science fiction. I forgot what else. And I would read these serials in there. People like Alfred Bester <coughs> were putting um, serialized versions of what became classic books later, like The Demolished Man, um, into something like Amazing Stories. And so that led me to realize there were actually books like this because you didn't find them in the library in those days. Mm. They weren't legitimate enough. There were books like this. And where were the books? They were in the second-hand bookstore on Broadway for 10 cents a piece. So I just dove in head first, and it was wonderful. I loved it. I read more of that than almost anything else in my teens. Mm -hmm. And then I started to grow up, and they didn't, and I stopped for a long time. But that was a lot of my teen reading. That and adventure stories. Things like, uh, oh, John Buchan, The 39 Steps, and the, that other guy who wrote those wonderful, that wonderful story of the, the guy who tries to kill Hitler, and he ends up on the run in England, hiding out. Oh, come on, he'll come back to me. I'll tell you later. <laughs> there were some wonderful adventure stories being written, mostly about espionage and uh, European politics, and, um, and some about big game hunting in, in Africa. And I kind of, between that and the science fiction, I was sort of coming kind of homing in on what my interests were going to be as a writer. You said something interesting there. You said you grew up and they didn't. Mm -hmm. what, what's <laughs> that about? Well, <clears throat> this will be a highly idiosyncratic and personal history of science fiction, and not a very long one. Um, at the time that I started reading, it was all really pell-mell young people's adventure. And, you know, up 
uprisings and revolutions on the planet such and such, and, and fighting off and finding a way to deal with the natives of some place who were this big and had many feet. Uh, <laughs> and that got a little old as people got to be more than 12, uh, people who were relatively mature. And so um, there was an effort among the, at that time, primarily male science fiction writers to, to revive the original excitement of science fiction from the 40s, because it, you know, it really took off after the war, uh, World War II. And they called this the new wave, and it was, um, <clears throat> it was importing into science fiction more literary forms, so that it was an effort to raise it above pulp level. And that was people like Bob Sil Silverberg, for example, was an example of someone who's trying to do that. And that was great, and it did help, but what got left out was half the world, because there were no women in these stories. There were fake women, but there were no real women, and there were no women's concerns, with very few exceptions. There were always exceptions, but they were really hard to find, and there weren't many of them. And so for a lot of girls like me, when you got into your mid-teens and realized you weren't there, you stopped reading it. And it was, you know, it was all about, there was a lot more about technical specs at that time, because this stuff had come out of popular mechanics. It was, it was written for guys in their garages inventing things originally, and boys who were trying to invent things and understand how car engines worked. And I think that kind of stayed the major thrust for a while. The new wave tried to change it and move it more into, into a more literary form with broader uh, interests. But there was really no uh, place in these stories for real women. There, were, there was a place for, you know, the, the, what are, the stereotype of the scientist, beautiful daughter who needs to have everything explained to her. Uh, go see Forbidden Planet. She's right there. So, <clears throat> um, in, in that film. I have seen Forbidden Planet. Yes, you know who I mean. It's, it's, it's really obvious. This is a, a, a male screenwriter's dream of what a woman is like. So um, I, stopped, I stopped reading it. And actually, when the feminist boom hit, after the new wave had really started, um, and to my mind was what injected the real vitality into the form. I don't think the new wave really did that. It injected, the new wave brought different, more intellectual considerations. Psychology, broader psychology, and um, you know, some other considerations. But when women came in, what had happened was we'd all been watching Star Trek on TV, early Star Trek, black and white. And there were a whole bunch of women who had been watching this stuff, and there was a woman on the bridge, and she had a short skirt, but she was female. That was Uhuru. Uh -huh. And the stories were interesting, and they were full of the way people think, and the way people behave, and why do they do the things they do? Not what kind of a gadget will solve this problem that's going to kill us if we don't solve it in five minutes. So. I think a lot of us had a kind of a hiatus where we stopped reading science fiction and we read mainstream or other things. And then we realized suddenly that there were these women in the field who were writing for women readers. And they were writing about all the stuff that the guys had left out. And what happened was it just blew the whole thing open and brought in these enormous rivers of vitality and energy from women who had simply been cut out except as silent readers for the most part. That's my version. There are other versions. <laughs>